Yeah, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Before we start here, I just want to check out with our attendees. We have over 50 people registered, and the first people are checking in. Great, 20 are in already. Yeah, so welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Virtual Roadshow series of Swiss Resource Capital and also Commodity TV. And we are very happy and proud that we have Bluestone Resources here today, an emerging gold producer in Guatemala. And uh, you see already Jack Landin, who is uh, yeah, got up very early in the morning because he lives in Vancouver. And welcome and good morning, Jack. How are you? Thank you, Jochen. It's good to be here. Not too early, so don't worry. We're all good. Okay, super, perfect. So just let me do some technical and legal remarks. Uh, first of all, yeah, welcome everybody. Still people are checking in. Um, we are making sure that we fully comply to the European, German and Swiss data security law. Um, so nobody can see the name of each other. Nobody can see the email addresses. Um, when you have questions, please use the chat function. The chat function is the third um, point at the uh, gray vertical bar you have. And so you can type in any kind of uh, questions uh, you have, of course. I will type also something here. Hello to our webinar that you see that. And uh, yeah, would be great to uh, have a lot of questions after the presentation. Um, yeah, Bluestone Resources, as I said, it is a fantastic company. We are working now several years together. Jack Landin joined uh, last year the company, and he's also the son of Lucas Landin, who is the may one of the yeah or the largest shareholder in the company and is backing the company a lot. Uh, the Landin family is very well known and well connected in the mining um, business and did a lot of successful yeah uh, deals, I would say, and brought uh, companies into production. And I think here with Bluestone Resources. We have the same. This company will be going into production probably by the end of next year, hopefully latest 2022. But Jack will elude to that in a second. Yeah. And so I think we got to start with the slides. Before I give the word to Jack, I want to... Uh, uh, to share some thoughts. I had uh, yesterday, and as you know me, I'm a point and figure chart analyst also since uh, yeah, a good uh, 30 seven years uh, i yeah got the uh, the chart here from bluestone resources and you see the pointed figure chart looks outstanding because we are working to break through the resistance line at two dollars fifty the stock is approximately 230 to 235 which is uh, the old resistance line from 2014 up to today and when this breaks honestly ladies and gentlemen my first target is nine Canadian dollars. I know that sounds a little bit hyper bullish, but you know me, uh, I'm uh, always uh, good uh, for a clear statement. And I really see that, uh, that we're going to see those nine Canadian dollars. And after Jack's presentation, you will know why. And I want to give the word now to Jack. Also, uh, a um, remark from our side. We are, of course, recording this. And uh, this will be then um, published uh, probably tomorrow evening at Commodity TV. So you also have a replay and it will go out on YouTube and our whole social media network. Yeah. And then I would say, Jack, the floor is yours. And please give us an insight into your fantastic company. Thank you, Jochen. Appreciate the introduction and uh, you're really putting the pressure on me to perform. But uh, no, I'm, I'm super happy to be here today to, to present to all of you. And uh, I intend to take you through the Q3 2020 corporate presentation for Bluestone Resources. And as Jochen said, at, at any time, if there are questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them from, from anybody on this call. And, and you know, we can, we can answer questions on a follow up as well. So I'll go through the, the presentation here and I think I can control it from the the bottom of the screen here. Yes. Um, so as I'm as I'm going through, of course, I'm making forward-looking statements. So this is just a disclaimer. So please understand that these are forward-looking statements as I'm presenting. But really, you know, the the story of Bluestone is is centered around our flagship asset, Cerro Blanco, which is located in southeastern Guatemala. And this is a snapshot and a kind of just a one one slide to tell the story. And I'll take you through in detail over the next you know 30 to 40 minutes here. But really, you know, it starts with Cerro Blanco. It's a compelling opportunity to invest in the gold space at this time. What we have is a permitted um, high grade underground deposit. Uh, the exploitation license and the underground construction permit is already in place. And this is a high grade deposit, as you see in the second line there. 
We updated our resource in November of last year. And so what we're contemplating is a 1.4 million ounce at 10 gram per ton gold resource. And that actually last year when we updated the model, uh, the resource model, we added 200,000 ounces into the measured and indicated. And you'll see in the next slides that we are actually infill drilling currently as we speak, we've identified extensions of this resource and we are growing it continue, continually as we're also advancing with engineering. So it's very exciting. The deposit is continuing to grow. When we look at the costs, because of its high grade nature and the, 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 the near surface nature of the mine, it's not a deep mine, we've got a low unit cost and therefore we generate extremely robust economics, which you will also see in some later slides. The infrastructure that's already in place really puts us at a significant advantage. So the previous owner, which was Glamis, which was then bought out in 2006 by Gold Corp, sunk a significant amount of capital into the Cerro Blanco and the adjacent Mita Geothermal Project, which I'll talk about towards the end of the presentation. So that you see there about 230 million US has already been sunken into this project. And that again, puts us at a very significant advantage when we go into the full, full swing construction phase. Again, so we're, we're basically Bluestone Resources, an emerging gold producer. We're a junior developer right now in one of the best industries to be in when we look at the, the global economy and, and the, the climate and the, the appetite for investors to join the gold market. So just quickly on the, on the corporate structure. Um, so this is as at August 3rd, you see the share price. Today, I think it's trending at $2.30 Canadian per share which puts our market cap at over 330 million Canadian. Um, and we've got significant room to grow that market cap. And you'll see through some slides and later on through our comparison with our peers, this company has some serious room to grow and some room to run. Um, at the bottom of the slide here, the bottom left, you can see the major shareholders. So CD Capital, which is a resource fund out of the UK, controls about 12% of the outstanding shares. And my family, the Lundin Family Trust, owns about 26% of the outstanding shares. Both shareholders are very committed to this company and to this project and to the Lundin Group. And so we'll be continuing to show support and, and really follow this project through to production and look at growing and, and extending the opportunities um, as, as we continue to develop. Um, analyst coverage, what you're seeing on the right here, we've got an average target price of $4. I think Jochen will say this with me, that that is way too low. Um, very conservative. Very conservative. So <laughs> we've, got, we've got significant upside there. I think when, when we talk about the catalysts that are, that are going to be coming through the pipeline in the next six months, um, there's a lot of good information that we'll be presenting to the market. And so I think we'll get re-rated by the analysts at that time. But anyways, 230 $2.30 with the target price of $4 is, is still a healthy, uh, healthy looking company. So this slide is, is just an, an overview of kind of the genesis of where we are today and, and where we've come from. So Bluestone Resources picked up or purchased the Cerro Blanco project from Gold Corp for a total cash consideration of 20 million US in May of 2017. Um, so in May of 2017, when we, when we picked up the project, we embarked on an extensive geological mapping and, and really geological interpretation exercise to understand the deposit better and to drill out the deposit more. So our geologists could come in and remap and understand, okay, this is the orientation. It's a, it's a tricky mine because it's a low sulfidation epithermal deposit. And, and I mean, I don't want to get too technical with the nature of it, but the gold, and you'll see in a picture, is locked up in quartz veins. So understanding the orientation of these veins is critical for our mining engineers to be able to develop a, you know, a very sound mine plan. So anyways, we've been basically continuously drilling since 2017. And in January of 2019, we were able to release a feasibility study that again shows very robust economics and is really why I'm here today to present to you all. Um, and, and since January 2019, we've continued to drill out the deposit, but we're also now gearing up for development activities. And so when you release the feasibility study to when you actually go into development, a lot of work needs to be undertaken, a lot of advanced engineering, a lot of recruitment, a lot of training, a lot of community engagement, all of that. And project financing is of course going on in parallel. So there's a lot of work going on and it's all continued to ramp up even through this kind of COVID-19 um, COVID pandemic that has definitely 
you know, caused uncertain times for every company in the world, every industry, but we're, we're faring very well. And I'll explain why in, in a later slide. So this is kind of an overview ge geographically of where the project is located. So the Cerro Blanco project is, is in southeastern Guatemala, and we're about 160 kilometers by road. So 160 kilometers down the Pan American Highway um, from Guatemala City. And we're connected to significant infrastructure at the mine. And there's a town of Asuncion Mita, which I believe you'll see in a video in the next slide, that's, that's only about five to six kilometers away from us that has a population of around 20,000. So significant advantage when it comes to infrastructure and where this project is located. And you can see in this picture, I mean, the deposit is, is tucked up in this hill in the center of the slide here. There's already an infrastructure in place and around us is, is mainly ag agricultural workers, uh, you know, farmer, ranchers and, and melon farmers. And so um, we've got, you know, significant support from these individuals and these and these companies and these 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 people working in the area um, because they like to see that there's more business coming into their community. So that local engagement is, of course, critical for us. Feasibility study economics is, is what we're going to be looking at here now. I want to mention this feasibility study does not include those 200,000 ounces that we added into the resource in November of last year. And on top of that, we are continuing to drill out and, and towards the end of this year, we'll, we'll add resources into, into the new resource estimation. So this feasibility study is contemplating what you see here is an eight year mine life, about 3.4 million tons to be pulled from the underground and milled. Uh, at around an 8.5 gram per ton mineable reserve uh, with a significant recovery and total life of mine production around 900,000 ounces of gold. But when you, again, when we're looking at this, the, the deposit had not been drilled out as significantly as it, as it has been today and as we continue to drill out. So a lot of upside with the mine here, but what that also means is that there is some significant opportunities to to kind of grow the size of this project. Um, so when we look, when we look, and I see Jochen is circling the feasibility study, we, we, we generate those numbers at a $1,250 $1, an ounce gold price. So in January, 2019, that was a more realistic number than where we're at today. But with all of those kind of inputs and because of the capital that had been sunk into the project, it's a, it's a low capex project. I mean, we're contemplating in the FS 200 million. Um, our internal study that we're doing now is, is going to confirm that number, um, but we have room to kind of bring capital projects or projects that were contemplated for the operations phase into the capital period to really give us a more significant efficiency in the operation. So all of these things we're doing right now, but really what it boils down to in the FS economics is that 1250 an ounce, it's a 34% IRR or a two two year payback. Now we we got a bit cheeky and we ran the numbers at two thousand dollars an ounce, and I mean the the IRR it goes to 78% in a one year payback. I mean I don't want to focus too much on those numbers because that looks pretty outrageous. I mean the the fact of the matter is is that this is a very very robust project that gives us a lot of opportunity and wiggle room to look at how we want to develop and ultimately operate. Uh, so this this slide also kind of tells it all in terms of strong strong cash flow generation that this mine will will give to Bluestone Resources. And I know what Jochen's going to say. He's going to ask about a dividend, and I, I won't talk about that yet. But the fact of the matter is is when we're in production, we're going to be averaging around 90 million of free cash flow. And if we look at it at around 60 1600 dollars an ounce, close to 140 million of of free cash flow generated. Um, on average per year. So um, those margins that this, this mine gives us and that free cash flow that this mine gives us puts Bluestone Resources in a position to, to grow the gold company uh, into a multi-asset producer and developer. And so we have every intention of using Cerro Blanco as a company starter to, to grow and expand. And if we can do it in Guatemala and, and the engagement that we have with the local and national government has, has been very strong to date. I've personally met with the vice president of Guatemala and talked to him about Cerro Blanco and Bluestone Resources and the opportunities that you know we could 
work together and form a partnership with to to grow and and show that mining can be done responsibly in Guatemala. And so all of that is is what we're working towards. So a little bit more about the deposit. I won't dwell too much on the technical side, but what we're looking at here is a picture, a cross section cross sectional image of the of the deposit. So you can see it's near surface and the deposit is broken into two zones and this is where the major clusters of veins are located. So we've got the north zone and the south zone. We've completed our drilling of the north zone, you can see there, and we're now targeting our drilling rigs to the south zone and drilling is continuously in progress. And on the next slide, I'll show you, we've had, we've had some exciting, um, exciting targets that we've, we've followed up on and, and uh, seen that there's some extension into this deposit and laterally, it looks like this, this deposit is, is growing. I mean, at depth, we're not as focused because we see that the veins are extending out laterally. So, you know, to the left and to the right of the screen, it looks like we'll be able to add some resources out. Um, but really you see near surface, the red is showing the measured and indicated resource and the blue is the, the inferred resource, which we'll follow up with if, with our continuous drilling as we're in development. So all of this drilling is, is ongoing and, and towards the end of this year, we will update our resource estimate and I'm confident we'll add further ounces into our, into our resource and ultimately into our mineable reserve. So these are some, some recent exploration results. As I was mentioning, we are de defining the, de the deposit on the lateral extensions of, of the Cerro Blanco deposit. And so what you see here, and we re released these results in June, is that this deposit continues to demonstrate high-grade intercepts at the you know, lateral extents of the resource. And so what you're seeing here in this picture, this is a cross-sectional view of the south zone on the left there. And you can see that that, that hole that we drilled from surface, CB2420, which is the, the hole, the, how you identify the, the hole that we drilled, it hit a cluster of veins outside the resource envelope. And it showed that we had about 15.5 meters at 20 grams per ton. So all of that is not in the current resource. And this is the type of thing that we'll be adding into the resource uh, when we update the model towards the end of this year. So that, that picture in the center, I, I don't know how well you all can see it, but I mean, that's a picture of the core box and you can see the white area is the quartz veins where the gold is locked up in. And so then when you look at the picture on the right, you see the, the shaded areas with the different colors, that is the current resource. And now you can see that we're definitely going to be adding a big slice into that resource estimate, which again is what we're trying to do, grow, grow the size of the, of the resource and, and ultimately add more mining to this, to this project. So that's the Cerro Blanco deposit. And, and what you're looking at here in the center of the screen here is this red ellipse, which goes around these black lines is that's the Cerro Blanco deposit. And the black lines are the existing infrastructure that the previous owner had developed. So again, we've got North and South accesses to this deposit, which is a significant advantage. When companies start to build projects, it's always a very big challenge getting those first meters, getting underground and developing uh, further underground, because of course you're you're learning the geology, you're learning how the, the ground reacts, but we already have that information in our database. So significant advantage there. But what also you're looking at here is the concession that Cerro Blanco sits in. And there are these, these red, the red um, thermal map that you're looking at is geochemical samples that were taken in the soils in this area. And it shows that there's gold in the soils and therefore there's attractive targets within the concession that we already control. And these blue tags here, you see different numbers of holes, and then you can see some pretty significant intercepts. So the first one on the top there, CB236, that's 7.6 grams per ton at 13.5 meters. Um, that, is, that is a very attractive target that Gold Corp had drilled. All of these blue tags are, are, are holes that the previous owner had drilled. And once we have Cerro Blanco in you know, full development phase and, and that's going well, we're gonna be following up on these targets and, and who knows, maybe there's a possibility to add another, another standalone mine in the concession or at least to have some satellite 
uh, mining that could then go to our primary mill. So this 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 deposit and this concession is very exciting for us, and we're we're super happy with what we're you know what we're further developing and what we're further realizing with our you know detailed investigations. So the next slide here is talking about the the update of the work that we've been doing and we've been undertaking in in Q in Q2 and really what we're going to be doing throughout the remainder of the year. So as I mentioned, you know, we're 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 in this phase where we're advancing with our de-risking of the project, which means we're doing basic engineering, we're taking all of the inf information that currently exists on the project and bringing that into a higher level of engineering. <clears throat> A higher level of confidence on the project and, and basically creating an internal study which will be looked at as the blueprint for our development phase. We've engaged with a mine building firm out of Quebec which I previously worked in Ecuador with on the development of Fruta del Norte which is a, a project controlled by another Lundin group company called Lundin Gold. Um, for those of you that know about it I mean it's a, it's a very exciting company and a very exciting project that I previously built with, with G Mining Services. And so we're looking at kind of replicating the success of the previous project. And what that means is you have a lot of work to be done in terms of trade-off studies to make sure that things were contemplated in the feasibility study are actually confirmed that that's the right way to go. And if we see room for optimization, then this is the time for us to do it. So all of that on the technical side is being worked through. And then of course, when it comes to long lead items, so generally things like the, the grinding mills and other big pieces of equipment pro for the process facility and the underground mining equipment, we've identified what the sizing and what types of equipment this needs to be. So we're in a position and we have the financial capability with 60 million in the bank today to put long lead uh, put those orders in for those long lead items and put those down payments down. So we'll be looking at doing that in the coming weeks, actually. So, so that's a that's a really exciting for us. Once we you know put those those orders in, then Yokin, you know now there's there's no turning back. And so it's it's uh, it's really exciting for us to be in a position to have identified what we need in terms of the big componentry to build this project. Yeah, this is why I'm a shareholder. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> no turning back. <laughs> yep, no turning back. And so, so when we look at the catalysts over the next 12 months, I mean, we continue to advance. Um, we're firing on all cylinders with our engineering. We're ramping up with our recruitment and hiring all of the skilled individuals that we need to to make sure that we don't miss out on anything. It's a complex industry, of course, building a mine. There's lots of different technical things to consider, but also social and environmental. And we we give that social and environmental side of the business equal or maybe more importance, more of a weighting than, than the technical side, because if you're not engaging with the community, if you're not focused on doing things in a responsible manner, then there's no place for companies like that in the mining space uh, today. And so we focus on that. But from the technical standpoint, the drill results that we'll be coming out with, I think, are very exciting, especially when you when you see and, and hopefully you understand what I was showing um, that the deposit can can grow in resource financing. So project financing, we we raised about 92 million Canadian dollars uh, in May of this year. And that was a big you know equity ticket for us. And now the rest of the project financing we're looking at is with a debt facility, um, with a group, a syndicate of banks that are willing to lend somewhere in the range of 180 to 200 million US. And that will give us the basically the money that we need to to get ourselves into production. So that's advancing very well. Our finance team has been talking with this syndicate of banks since uh, I believe April of last year. So we've developed a strong relationship, and and they see that we're advancing, and they were very very supportive and and happy to see that we were able to raise money in the middle of the pandemic for for Bluestone, and I think that gives them more confidence in, in our ability to, to drive this project forward. Um, as I mentioned, the long lead time orders, so things that have 40 to 50 week lead times, we're gonna be putting, or, putting, um, putting orders down for those, um, probably before Q4, but definitely in Q4. And then what we want to do is initiate these early works activities before the end of the year. Early works activities is basically comprised of mainly earthworks. It's setting the, prepping the pads, creating the, the area to be ready for 
construction activities to ramp up. So you, you don't need a significant size team in order to do that. You need a few expats and, and a few kind of skilled labor workers to go in and prep the site and get ready for that big um, kind of site uh, mobilization, which we're contemplating right now, end of Q1, early Q2 for um, construction phase to start. Um, and then again, as I've mentioned several times, the resource estimate will start towards the end of this year and, and really in the early part of next year be, be completed. Um, and then that will turn into a new life of mine plan, which will hopefully be able to demonstrate more ounces into the mine plan and a longer mine life for Cerro Blanco. So I got to do a little bit of promoting here because I mean, we are talking to potential investors. And so I just want to show on this slide, it demonstrates that we are significantly undervalued when we look at our, you know, a handful of peers that we are you know, measured against and, and we're measured against these peers because of the size of the projects that they have uh, and the phase that their projects are in. So how we stack up, and I mean, you can see in this, in this table in the middle, but if you wanna just kind of visually see it, the slide or the, the bars below on the, on the below, bottom part of this slide here, blue stone is at the left and you can see the blue bars are showing our market capitalization and the circle, is showing our average uh, free cash flow based on um, based on the gold equivalent production, and so we have room to grow. If you consider us these companies to be our peers, um, we're generating almost the best free cash flow throughout the life of the project, uh, and and we're we're quite undervalued at at um, you know today we're at 330 million Canadian. So um, I mean, and this leads when, to my price target. And this, this is exactly it. I think you can, you know, you know, we, 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 we maybe sound like we're joking, but I think that this nope. is seriously the space that we're in um, and the momentum that this project has uh, and, and the management team that's behind this project and the investors that are currently behind this project. Uh, it's, it's really a, an exciting opportunity for me as CEO to, to try and continue to grow this, this company and, and Bluestone or Cerro Blanco is, is really the company starter that uh, I'm fortunate to be, to be working on. So the next is, is another kind of promotional slide, but really what, what we consider ourselves, you know, we're a junior developer. When you get into production, you naturally get re-rated and you join a new basket of peers. So you go and you're looking at yourself against companies that are in production. As we're not in production, we're considered a developer. And so you have you know, lower multiples because you haven't proven to the market yet that you're, you're a producing company. And so obviously we're not making any money right now. We're spending, spending money and we're gonna be spending more money to get ourselves into that new basket of peers. And so what I like about the mining industry and how, how clear cut it is, is if you, you get a project that's worth developing, you set milestones and you get the project financing, and you get into production, then if you do it all in the right way, you get re-rated and you join a new basket of peers. And, and basically you, you then become a more valuable company by you know, following up on your commitments and, um, and getting yourself to the next phase. And so that's, that's also the slide I think demonstrates the opportunity. And, and you know, for reference, you can see the green there, Lundin Gold, we followed that same trend line. You know, we were hovering around $5 per share throughout the development phase. And, and once we got ourselves into production, um, we're valued at around $12 today, which is still cheap. I mean, the, the, the opportunities for lending gold are significant as well. So just, you know, really quickly to touch on why, why Bluestone um, and, and why those of you on the call today should be, should be interested in, in the company. Um, the company is backed by the Lundin Group, as I mentioned. My name is Jack Lundin. I'm, I'm the third generation that's, that's been in the business uh, for over four decades uh, in natural resources. So oil and gas, base metals, precious metals, um, uranium, uh, renewable energy. We're, we, we touch all, all of the um, natural resource industry uh, and basically all commodities. And so this is, you know, the business model that we have has been tried and tested and, and we're continuing to grow it with that same model. Um, and I think, you know, the, this, this slide, I won't get into those major transactions, but of course this is recorded and you can get this presentation online. If you want more information on the Lundin Group, you can also go to our website. But 
I mean, it just shows that we've got the backing of experienced leaders in the industry. And so the Lundin group of companies is comprised of about 12 companies right now. Uh, and we all operate on our with our own autonomy, but we also can lean on each other for advice and for um, for guidance if needed. And so that also puts us a, at a significant advantage, maintaining entrepreneurial um, focus, but being able to rely on other companies, other CEOs, other projects to see what they did, what went wrong, and take lessons learned to apply them to to projects like Cerro Blanco. And, and, and lastly, uh, Jochen, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but this is you're fine. Another, no problem. All good. This is just another um, unique opportunity. I mean, what we what we're seeing in the mining space. Uh, I mean, it's trailing a little bit from the oil and gas sector, but ESG is, of course, a very big focus, um, and, and it's going to continue to become more of a focus for mining projects as we see the world pivot towards a more uh, green energy and um, you know less CO2 emissions, um, less uh, impact on the environment in, in many different aspects. But for for investors and for potential financiers of the of Bluestone Resources, one very unique opportunity for us um, is to generate our uh, the power to power the project through renewable energy. So adjacent to Cerro Blanco, we have what's called the Mita Geothermal Project. And this is another project that Cerro Blanco and, um, and Mita were, were advanced with in parallel by Goldcorp. So you see they sunk, Goldcorp sunk about 60 million. Um, and some of that is, has been money that we've sunk into the project to see if there is actually a feasible way of generating renewable um, energy through geothermal resources and through, through what you're seeing here is in April 2018 we did some flow tests to see that yes we can we can actually generate um, electricity through through renewable energy and we are going to be continuing to to follow up on this once we have Cerro Blanco more advanced um, and and the permit that we have is to generate and operate at 50 megawatts um, of of power generated through the geothermal plant. We don't need that, obviously. So, I mean, one opportunity is for us to sell into the grid. And Guatemala, I think what, what we're going to be seeing pretty soon is a lot of their electricity is generated from bunker fuel and, um, you know, heavy oil. And so I think what they want to see is a power call and a focus on more renewable energy coming into their grid. And so, again, we're positioned very well with, with this Mita geothermal project. Um, so we'll continue to study this to see what are what are the synergies between Mita and, and Cerro Blanco. And I think we'd be a very unique project to be able to generate the power for our mine by 100% renewable energy. And I think that's a that's a very unique opportunity and something that investors should understand because we do focus and we are committed to to ESG, to making sure that our impact on the environment is as minimal as possible. Um, and this is just another way of, of, you know, demonstrating that. And so the license that we have is, is definitely something that's not lost on us. But I will say the focus is, is getting Cerro Blanco off the ground. Um, and then in parallel, we'll see if we can generate electricity through, through the Mito Geo, Mita Geothermal Project. I think that would be uh, very interesting for us and, and something that we'd be very pleased with uh, if that day comes. So that would mean that you are a green ESG gold producer. Exactly. And actually, I, I've actually had um, some discussions. I was in Geneva um, a few weeks ago, Jochen, and talking with some individuals that are trying to buy physical gold from projects that are what's considered green uh, producing mm -hmm. projects and the framework is is still being developed there but i think it's soon coming down the pipeline the fact that there are you know physical gold traders looking at different projects and how that gold was extracted means that that wave is coming and it's real so we want to make sure that mm -hmm. even without mita we want to uh, limit the exposure or limit the um, impact to the environment and so i think that given the way in which we we would like to mine this project even without geothermal uh, or renewable energy powering us, we we can demonstrate that we are sustainable and and green a green operator. And so, 
um, that's very important for us. And I, I don't want that to be lost on the investors today. Absolutely. And I think there's already tensions in the market uh, to pay even a premium for green gold, what I heard. Yeah, I think. And and again, I mean, it's, it's still early days, but there's mm -hmm. definitely for the oil and gas sector premiums on producing producing um producing oil and gas with low co2 emissions and so um lundin energy which is our flagship petroleum company in the lundin group we we definitely we've committed to um zero carb to becoming carbon neutral by 2030 and that's a very that's a very innovative approach in the oil and gas sector and that's again another advantage being in the lundin group we can pull on their you know, resources and see how was it that they did that? What approach did they take and, and how can we apply it to a very different industry? I mean, natural resources are natural resources, but when you talk about oil and gas versus base metals or base metals versus precious metals, I mean, there are, there are similarities, but there are also a lot of differences as well. So. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So that's, that's, that's it. I mean, we have more slides in the appendix and I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, those of you on the call may have today. Fantastic, Jack. Thank you very much for, as always, a, a great presentation. And I even like your company more. I think I should buy some stock afterwards. Um, but yeah, let's come to the questions as there are a lot of already popping up here. I want to start with Paul from uh, London, who is asking, is there any interest already from Asian and South American investors in your company? Yes, there is. I mean, we've been um, we've been marketing. I joined the company in in January of this year, and um, you know, before the you know global travel restrictions were implemented because of COVID nineteen, we we traveled a lot. Um, we went down to Guatemala um, to meet the to meet the government there, but then we went to different conferences. So there was PDAC where I met Jochen for the first time. There was BMO um, in Florida. Um, and we've been talking, we went to New York, we've been to Toronto several times meeting with different investors and, and some of them have been Latin American and some of them have been Asian. And I think um, you see obviously with what's happened in, in the last several months with um, Chinese companies coming in and buying, buying some projects at significant premiums in mm -hmm. the gold space. So there's definitely, definitely been attraction there. Mm -hmm, super. Then Sunny from Hamburg is asking, since when is CD Capital a shareholder and did they participate in the recent financings? CD Capital has been a shareholder since the project was picked up by Bluestone Resources. So since back in 2017. Um, and they did, yep, they went in on this last equity raise. Um, they didn't go in pro rata, but you see they still have a significant shareholding. Um, and I think you know, they're, they're very committed to stay with us. And, and Carmel Daniel, um, who's, who's the founder of the fund, uh, I have a very good relationship with as she was a big investor or CD was a big investor at Lundin Gold for the Fruta del Norte project. So um, I think, uh, you know, which is a big success, by the way, <laughs> because, which thankfully was, was, you know, yeah. a, a very big success. And, and that's why we're applying lessons learned from there. But, but, you know, having those relationships with, with fund managers and with investors that are willing to support projects like this because of the past successes is also another way to kind of continue to grow your your uh, investor base. And I think um, that's exactly what we're doing here by seeing mm -hmm. the family and, and CD as big shareholders continuing to support through different financing. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Uh, Paul from Frankfurt is asking about the political stability in Guatemala. So what's what's the case today? And if you can maybe leave that short, because I know we can talk about politics for yeah. for, for a week easily, no, right? right? <laughs> no, that, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, that, that is a very good question. And it's important for the investors to know that in Guatemala, they, they, they recently in January swore in a new president and new cabinet. And they are different in the last um, in the last government in the sense that they're, they're much more, I think, center left, but pro business and, and willing to see international companies come in and in natural resources, because I, I personally met the vice president, the minister of energy and mining and the minister of environment to get a sense of, is this, you know, are, that you want to see us producing or developing Cerro Blanco and consider the jurisdiction that the project is in. Um, and then, of course, the the appetite from the national uh, or the federal government. And so I'm, I'm confident that the relationship that we're building with the, 
you know, the federal government and the, the, you know, the president and his cabinet is strong. And equally with the, with the local um, stakeholders, we, we were working with them to, to make sure we're managing expectations, but also putting opportunities out there so that they can see there is, you know, a runway for individuals in the surrounding communities to, to grow their skills and, and to, to get jobs for, for many years to come. Of uh -huh. course, when we build a project, you always want to offer more jobs, but that you have to cap it at some. And so managing that expectation is, is very critical for us. But so mm -hmm. far, uh, it's, it's working well. Fantastic. So now we come to some technical questions. Uh, Chris from Munich is asking, can you provide more details on the optimization of the process flow sheet, meaning pre-oxidation, grinding final, reagent optimization, or sorting? Yes, absolutely. So what we had in the feasibility study was, um, and I'll get a little bit technical here, but I'll try not to, I don't want to lose anybody, but mm -hmm. you know, we had for, for the crushing circuit, we were considering three stage crushing and then two ball mills for our grinding circuit. And what that meant, and, and that was because we didn't have an, a significant amount of test work to prove that we could simplify that flow sheet. So when you don't have um, enough data to support, um, to support your study, you have to go conservative. And so we look at, okay, how can we get to the grind size that we need without, you know, hurting our efficiency or, or without needing to use too much energy. And so one way to do that is up front with the crushing circuit. The next way is to, to grind it in the, in the ball mills. What we then did is we, when I came in, I said, I, I want to make sure that we, we give enough resources to the metallurgist and the process team to really look at the ore variability in the deposit to see what is the true hardness of this rock. And if we can simplify based on that test work, then let's do it. And so we did the test work. And we were able to see that we can actually move from three stage crush to one stage crush. And instead of having two ball mills, we can go to a uh, sag and ball mill system, which is much more conventional, which is easier to maintain. You're dealing with less equipment. So operability, I mean, the efficiency there is, is, is much nicer. And then kind of on the back end, we're looking at if we need to have gravity or not. But because all of this, you know, ore is going to be producing uh produced into dore bars uh we have no flotation cells so it's it's really just a um a leaching circuit at the end so all of that means i mean it's a very simple flow sheet uh mm -hmm. when i look at this flow sheet compared to you know i'm comparing back a lot now but to to fruta del norte uh fruta had had uh, a significant flotation cell in the in the mineral process um but we don't have that so from an operability standpoint it's it's uh, quite a pleasing mill to operate. Mm -hmm. Then another technical question also from Chris, how was the underground trial mining reconciling with the block model? Is additional resource definition drilling required for conversion? Yes. So, um, you know, we've, we did a little bit of development last year. We haven't done much development this year. It's mainly been, you know, we already have those drill cutties underground so we can, mm -hmm. we can access the deposit from underground with our drill rigs. And so that's what we're doing. We've got five rigs right now turning uh, from the surface and underground. Um, and, and what we're seeing is that the, you know, the temperature is the, is the challenge. It's the temperature of the underground is, is the technical challenge that we have at the mine. It's, it's a hot spring environment. And so the water is coming out at a significant temperature. But because we've already seen that this mine has developed below the water table, about three kilometers of lateral development, um, it, it can be done. And so you know, once we get our, our new mining equipment to site, we'll do some trial mining. Um, but I think also the definition drilling is, is very important for the nature of these deposits, because as I mentioned, you have um, structures and veins, you know, going laterally, they're going vertically, and, and the orientation and understanding those is critical for our mine design team. So um, you always learn more when you're underground and developing. Uh, but we've got a pretty good handle on that, thanks to the development that already exists. Mm -hmm. Then also, again, a technical question from Chris. I know he's uh, super technical, but I like that a lot. Uh, any EIA amendments required following the feasibility study design optimization? Is a potential finer grind carrot for in the TSF design or changes on dry stack TSF required? Yes, so there is an amended 
an amendment to the environmental management plan that has already been submitted in June last year. And we're now working with the regulators to clarify any observations they've made. And so that will that will be um, a big kind of a big um, ticket for us when we get the approved environmental management plan back. But and the, sorry, the approved amended environmental management plan. But we we've determined and we know that we can continue and advance with um, earthwork activities uh, prior to receiving that approval. So um, from a permitting standpoint, we're we're confident with where we're at, and we've got you know I talk about resourcing up and making sure we have the right people to to deal with the uh, permitting process and the social per process, the community relations that that we've already staffed up, and so we've got a good team there. Um, the next question, I believe was re with respect to the grind size and the trade-off on, on the tailings um, impoundment. And so we are contemplating a dry stack tailings facility. And so understanding how to properly distribute and deposit the tailings and make sure that it's dried and make sure that the grind size is, is able to be filtered and, and, and stacked um, is very important for us. And that all is going on in our online or, or our ongoing trade-off studies and so the um the dry stack uh, and and maybe adding in another uh de-sliming circuit for the tailings is, is something that we're looking at and and that's the technical side that's that's well advanced as well mm -hmm. fantastic before we come to the next question i have uh, chris uh, a, a another chris here who is asking how can we get copy of the slides of course you can get that from our website uh, i just uploaded uh, this presentation on our website in english so you feel free to go to resource-capital.ch and then to bluestone which you find on the companies and there you can download it so next question is uh, asking about as you are working underground um do you face any problems with let's say do you have to do ac do you have to cool down and uh, what are the costs for electric equipment but i think this is uh, with you guys not really the case because this is normally south africa when you go down two three four kilometers i could imagine because you are quite shallow in the mining right <clears throat> that's correct i mean we're, we're we're shallow we're near surface and i mean if we were in an area that didn't have as many inhabitants as it did and we weren't surrounded by communities we could this this would be an ideal open pit project but i mean it's still a very feasible underground project and that's why we're advancing with it as an underground development concept um though cooling actually Jochen, is required uh proper ventilation is is critical um and so the fact that we already have a north and south access to the deposit so we can drive from drive through the north portal and exit through the south portal that means that we have airflow but we also have four ventilation raises that have mm -hmm. already been drilled out and we'll continue to add ventilation raises as we go down into the deposit and also our dewatering strategy is very important to to ensure that we take out as much water as possible before our workers are going in working in the in the face and so we've got experts um you know consultants supporting us with our dewatering strategy also with our cooling strategy and there's a lot of unique and innovative things that that are happening in the industry today that we're going to be utilizing but another thing is if it gets too hot underground we are very near surface so accessing the you know the entrance of the mine is is very quick you know we're like Jochen was saying with with projects that are 2.5 kilometers underground um that that that's challenging. You can't just go up to surface for five minutes to grab a breath of fresh air. You have to have different systems in place. And we're also yeah. looking at that because, you know, we want people to be working in an environment that they're comfortable with. So things that you can do is is have um, underground refuge chambers that are maybe used in, in most mines as emergencies. We can use those as cooling rooms for yeah. our team to go in and, and um, you know, hang out in and to cool down before they go back to work. And then, of course, we look at autonomous equipment as well. The more autonomous the equipment can be, the less our people are at the working face um, and, and therefore, you know, the safer it will be. So we're, we're very focused on that. Mm -hmm. Robert has uh, from Const Lake Constance uh, two questions. And the first one is, is, uh, is a question I really like. How, why did the former owner sell you this outstanding project? I mean, 
this is crazy. If you look today and if you look like five years ago or four years ago, yeah, nobody would have thought that this, uh, this project comes out at such favorable economics. And the second question is, are there feed-in tariffs with local energy suppliers and how far away is the grid to be connected? Okay, I'll answer that last question first and then I'll get into mm -hmm. you know, the opportunity of why we bought this. Um, so, so there is a, a substation that was actually developed a couple of years ago, about, I think, eight to 10 kilometers from the project location. And so the reason why the Mita Geothermal project was so advanced was because that substation did not exist. And being able to guarantee that we could tie up to the grid was not as certain as it is today. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've, we were, um, we're in contact with uh, electricity providers and we're really, you know, advancing well with our long-term contracts there. And I think, you know, part of our, part of our development program is to, uh, you know, build that line from site to the substation. Um, and, and so that's ongoing and electricity is, is not, is not expensive. I mean, we're, we're contemplating seven, eight cents per, per kilowatt hour. So that's, um, that's something that we're very comfortable with uh, and, and putting into our economic model. Um, now, the opportunity for, for Bluestone to purchase Cerro Blanco, I mean, it, it all comes down to timing and what company controls the project and what position they're in. So Gold Corp, you know, they were working in Guatemala. They had an, an asset that was in production called the Marlin Mine. Um, and then they were, you know, looking as Cerro Blanco would be their next project to to develop in in uh, Guatemala. However, you know, things change with companies and their strategy changes. The Marlin mine was nearing its end of life and um, their their core assets. They wanted to spend more focus on on their core assets. And they determined that Cerro Blanco and Marlin together were were considered to be non core. And so. What they wanted to do was bundle up Marlin and Cerro Blanco together and sell both. But the chairman of Bluestone Resources, uh, John Robbins, he he saw what was going on and saw that there was a you know a very unique opportunity to go in and and just make a bid on Cerro Blanco and all of the other bidders. I, I believe did they they thought that you could only take them bundling together. And so taking on a reclamation project as you're trying to develop a new project isn't a very exciting thing to do. I mean, you're, you're burdened with um, reclamation when you're trying to get resources to build a new project. And so, you know, Bluestone made an offer on just Cerro Blanco mm -hmm. and there wasn't a lot of attraction at that time for other companies to, to do that. So, you know, we were able to, to get it at a, at a very good deal. Um, but that, but that's, that's business. I mean, you, you go in and, you know, we did the same thing with, with uh, Kinross and, and Lundin Gold in, in Ecuador. Um, Kinross was looking at writing down uh, Fruta del Norte. And we came in and saw that this was a very unique world-class asset in a jurisdiction that people thought was, was tricky to operate in. But we engaged with the government and said, if we purchase this, can we, you know, will you help us get it to production? And, and they did. And so we purchased it at 240 million uh, when there had already been over a billion sunken into the project. And so it's it's similar. This is a much smaller scale, but I mean that's that's how we operate in the Lundin Group. We look for opportunities uh, yeah. around the world. Yeah. So right space, right time, and some luck. Exactly. I mean, you have to <laughs> you have to go in, and I mean, you have to be optimistic at all times, yeah. and you have to go in and and, and look for those opportunities. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we did our due diligence, and so it just made sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, have an, I have a question also. As you know, I'm a number guy, and uh, I saw in the presentation you have a CapEx of $196 million, and you said you want to raise 180 to 200. So you have still $60 million from the last, I think it was $92 million financing left. Um, so what's, what's happening with the money? So that that's the true capex number. That doesn't mm -hmm. include all of the you know the pre-development activities, the engineering ah. work that goes into it, um, the money that we're spending to date to get into that development phase. It doesn't mm -hmm. include the you know the financing costs um, and working capital and things like that. So you know that the the number to keep the business alive because obviously that's what's paying our employees is is mm -hmm. the money that we're able to raise. And so. It's 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 more than just the 200 million yokin that we need to to keep mm. the business alive. And as I mentioned, I mean we're you know that's the feasibility study number. Since then, 
um, we've been doing various trade-off studies and optimizations. And so um, we'll see what the true CapEx number is in, uh, in several months, or I think mm-hmm. November, October latest, we will know what, you know, internally what the mm-hmm. true number is. And with that debt facility in place, if, if we need to raise some further money on, on the tail end of that to, to get us, you know, through fully project financing, that, that could potentially be another opportunity for investors to come into the story. So, uh-huh. I mean, all of that's happening within the within 2020 timeline. So, um, mm-hmm. no, yeah. that's fantastic. So we so we can say there is a, a final rest capex and there is a pre production capex. Just for the sure. understanding, because somebody sure. would might think, oh, the the the, the numbers are not matching. No, but that's I, fine. I, I, that's a great explanation. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, then uh, we have CD Capital with 12%. Uh, Lundin has 26%. So I think you are very safe from those two shareholders not to be taken over to cheap because that's my biggest worry. Yeah, well, right now, I mean, we're when when things happen and, and um, proposals come our way, of course, you, you consider them. But right now, I mean, we... We firmly believe in the project. We've now spent a lot of time building out a very strong execution team. And so, like you said, I mean, with the with the strong backing of, of just two major shareholders, um, I think it, it would be very hard to be taken out at a um, at a price that wasn't very healthy for all investors that are that are in the story now. Um, mm-hmm. But that's kind of outside of what we can control what we can control is is what we what we need to get ourselves in a position to to move this project from one phase to the next Mm -hmm. fantastic so final uh, calculation from my side um i did it with 600 dollar aisc i did it gold 1900 dollars, so the margin is 1300 dollars, and i came out at approximately 150 million us dollars after aisc Uh, let's call it pre-tax profit and maybe you have to deduct a little bit uh, for g and a but the thing is uh, this is half of your market cap almost today and uh, it looks to me like even even if, if, if you have to take a, a credit of whatever, 150 to $200 million, I think uh, the payback period is uh, less than 18 months and then everything is done, right? So this is, uh, I would call it a super cash machine. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, we, again, we're, you know, we're, we're going away from the, from the FS to go forward with detailed engineering. And so the mm-hmm. project is always, always adapting, but I mean, this, this is a significant, cash generating vehicle when we're in production and um the payback is is short and uh you know which the, brings the, the mass- risk massively down it does i mean there's yeah. there's of course always risks associated to to developing mines but um mm-hmm. the the opportunity here is is to get Sarah blanco into production as soon as possible focus on paying down that that um that debt and then and then going and expanding and, and looking for other projects in central or latin america you know ideally in guatemala um and so so that's where we're at i mean 2022 is our targeted year to get into first gold i know you said 2021 Jochen, but that's that's a bit of a stretch but 2022 i, I think is very much achievable uh even all things considered with with covid 19 the, the borders in guatemala have been closed for several months but it's it, we're seeing some early promising signs that september they might be able to open the borders and therefore we're ready with the team to to hit site right away we've already got representation on, on site right now we have anywhere between 70 to 100 people on site in an, any given day so strong presence from the national team uh, and then we've got uh, experienced expatriates ready to come into site and uh, mm-hmm. really get you know get the work rolling. Mm-hmm. So 2024 first dividend payment. 2024 first dividend. Payment. <laughs> we'll we'll talk about that <laughs> offline, Jochen. <laughs> I know there was a joke, not a forward-looking yeah. statement for the regulars. <laughs> I don't want to bring you into trouble. No, yeah. super. So I don't see any more questions here. We are almost an hour now online. That's fantastic. Yeah, this is done. Just let me double check here. No, I think we are super fine. That is all good. Also on my list here. Yep, that's all good. Yeah. So 
we are done. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jack. That was a great hour with you. And uh, I see already uh, the first postings here that uh, people want to buy stock. Uh, this is how I like it. And I will do the same, honestly, afterwards. That's for sure. And I'm very, very positive. And I stick uh, fully with my $9, uh, nine Canadian dollar price target. And uh, when we move on with the gold price, because as you know, my next gold price target is $2,440 and then $2,780. Then then we are in a new game and then I make a new calculation and I think we're going to have big fun with those targets. So, Jack, thank you very much. Have a great day. All the best. Um, yeah, keep healthy. That's the most important thing. And I hope we can yeah, meet us then next year, at least uh, personally. Um, I already heard that Vancouver even might not take place. Uh, this, this is possible, but I hope at least PDAC. But uh, we keep uh, all investors updated with our online interview series and also with this, what we have done today. And I would say, Jack, keep it going. Thanks to you. Thanks to your fantastic team and your fantastic employees and management team who make this happen and as you said there is no point of return i like that <laughs> thank you so much you can appreciate the support as always thank you very much and this uh, will be then yeah as a replay available probably tomorrow afternoon tomorrow evening on commodity tv as said you can find the presentation downloadable with a download link on our website uh, www.resource-capital.ch if you have any questions please feel free to come back at any time to us via email call us also check is there to ask questions and the team and uh, I think it's a fantastic story. I must not summarize that. This is outstanding. This will be a real cash cow. And we look forward, uh, of course, as you know me, I love the dividends. And I'm pretty sure they will pay somewhere in the near future than when they are in production. So I wish you all the best. Thank you very much from participate, for participating. And I have the feeling half of Europe was uh, here today in the room. Uh, that is fantastic. And uh, yeah, for this year, it looks like that we cannot do uh, again personal, uh, meaning physical roadshows. This is still not possible through to the travel restrictions and the quarantine. But we keep you all posted when this can restart again, uh, because then I have the feeling that me and my team will travel a lot. So thank you very much. Take care and go BSR, go gold, all the best. Thanks and bye-bye from Switzerland. Bye, Jack. Thank you very much.